Yeah, I got him. There you go. Oh, Joe Bradley. Yeah, nice of you to join us. I'll uh, make you co-host as well. You got a haircut. I've, I've just done I've sometimes since we're all bored without all these gigs, I've been mixing up my hair. <laughs> yes, Matt, the video is going to be available afterwards for you guys to refer back to. In fact, uh, this is going to go up on the Repopulate Mars um youtube and we have a previous uh, recording from another free class so even if you guys can't afford the class the uh full um Repopulate workshop that we do you can always refer back to these and obviously uh john's got some other videos up online i'm sure all these guys if you take a look have got i know tyler does classes so you can definitely piecemeal some of this together but uh we are here today to give you guys a free class um i think i think we've all really enjoyed teaching and um, sharing our skills and like helping people become better producers i've been really excited been doing the repopulate workshop i think this is the fifth go around and we've had enormous number of people sign music to labels take the next step and i think it's been rewarding for pretty much everyone here you know obviously everyone's more getting busier and busier starting to dj again and you know, to getting back to life. But I think I can speak for everyone. I say that people found it super rewarding to to share, you know, those little nuggets because music is for everybody. Like, there's no point in being precious about this, um, about keeping secrets. Like, you're always going to be able to become better and take next steps. So um, welcome to the Repopulate Workshop. This is our free class. Um, and John Summit's going to go first. He's going to take us through his project file for Make Me Feel. You'll recognize it. Big number one hit out on Insomniac Records earlier this year, amongst a number of his number one hits. But I know this will be particularly interesting for a lot of you if you like this sound. I think it's a sound that is very, very in vogue right now. It's big with Repopulate Mars. And um, John's become one of the biggest artists. So let's see how you did it. Awesome. Thanks, Lee. So I made this track at like the beginning of COVID when I thought lockdown would just last a couple of weeks. So I'm like, I need to lock, like, load up on bangers. Um, obviously, that wasn't the case, but I'm glad I made this track. Uh, I made this on my older MacBook, so some of the plugins don't work, but generally all of it's here. This is like the first version of it, too, where you'll see on this the last breakdown, I go just straight into the vocal. And then like any good track, this one was just made in a few hours because you kind of, you know, it's all about getting the right elements and stuff together. So I kind of just want to show you guys, you know, how I went from nothing to making this um, and a quick overview of that. But there's two ways I like generally start with tracks. Um, I like to start with a sample if possible and then make a baseline and stuff from there. Um, otherwise, I'll like, you know, just make an instrumental if you're not sitting on a sample and then find a sample from that um, or record your own vocals or whatever. I know um, uh, Steve and Deep at Purpose will go into recording your own vocals and everything because he's really great at that. But oh. uh, <laughs> but um, here, I'll show you the vocals. So I started out with a sample. I sp found it on Splice and I uh, sped it up and everything. The original sounded a little bit different. But this is what I ended up with. It's the way you make me feel. It's the way you make Sorry me feel. Trying to find that word. It's not. It's the way you look at me. It's the way you make me feel. It's the way you look at me. It's the way you make me feel. And then, kind of like if you know my track Deep End and like my I Miss You remix, um, there's like a very clear, you know, note progression with this vocal. So you put the tuner on it. And you see, it's the way you make me feel. It's the way you. You know, it's doing C, D, and E flat. So I generally know the track is basically in C minor, just from those notes. And then so I'll go, and then so from there I'll make the bass line. And because I basically have the bass line follow the vocal here. So if you guys see, I'll have them muted together. It's the way you make me feel. It's the way you look at me. And then if you solo the bass, you can kind of see it just follows the vocal perfect there. It's just the way you make me feel. So basically, that's how I started with the track. And once I had those elements down, the track kind of wrote itself from there. 
Um, to show how I made the baseline, there's like a few different ways I do baselines. Um, I usually just use operator. I showed that in the first like free class you guys can see on the Repod Plate YouTube. But for this, I actually just used a, uh, uh, like a saw base, like one shot, if you see this. And I have this one shot in like D, E, F, A, like everything. Um, so I'll give that pack away if, like when, for like the actual class and stuff. But um, if you guys see how just simple this is though, because I don't even think I had pitch bend on this. Yeah, I didn't have any pitch bend. So I just threw in the sample and sampler here. And then I did, you know, my processing and everything. But the main reason I'm showing this though, is just to show how simple it can be. Like you don't have to get too crazy with baselines. I do have baselines where I have, you know, four different layers and get pretty crazy with it and different toms and all that stuff too. But for a simple groove like this, the main purpose of this track is just having a simple groove with like a catchy hook, you know. And then because I know that the track's in C, I have the kick top here that's in C along with the lower kick. And then what else do I have here? And then everything else from there, you know, when I have my breakdowns and my builds, I have some atmosphere and stuff. Make sure that's in C. You can just go on Splice, Loopmasters, or whatever. Um, yeah, I hear all of this. Do not be scared to use samples. That's like kind of one big takeaway I have here too, as long as you use it in your own kind of unique way. Like here for this texture, I took three different samples and kind of put them all together, kind of make your own sound out of it. Um, but there's so much stuff out there that you can use as long as obviously like, you know, you make your idea itself unique and everything. Um, but yeah, from there, I added some synth shots and stuff on the drop which I'm pretty sure those are just one shot samples too, but in C, where are those at? You guys can see how simple this project file is though. There's like barely anything to it. One second, where am I going? <laughs> oh, whoops, wrong drop. There we go. And yeah, you have the C here. And that like by itself, it sounds kind of lame. It's literally just like a random synth loop I found on, what is this, Zenheiser or something. But then you put it like, cause it's in tune and stuff with the bass. Okay. Simply cut out the low end there too. So it doesn't conflict with the kick and bass. Um, I don't know what, I know Lee Curtis is a big mixing expert. I don't know what you think on this, but I don't like to cut I know there's like a general rule of thumb that you should cut everything below 200 hertz. I don't follow that because I think that makes everything sound kind of thin. Um, I don't follow that either. No. Okay. Okay. Cool. You mix by feel. I'm just mixing by feel, and that's when I go into the EQing today. I'm gonna say the same thing. If it sounds better, do it. If it sounds worse, then put that frequency back in. Yeah, it's very mm -hmm. simple. Yeah, like my entire mixing philosophy. I think Tyler is the same way too, is like, if it sounds good, it sounds good. And um, cause I, I hear like a lot of like very thin mixes where it's like, you could very much hear the kick and bass, but then all the percussion and hats and claps are very thin, like on top of it. And that's cause, you know, people cut out all the low and stuff like that. But you know, this track wouldn't have this drop if it wasn't for that. And this is not even like the fully mixed down master version cause you know, this is like before I had, I think I was probably working on the ARP at this point. Well, John, why did, why did you, why did you uh, cut one EQ then boost the, boost the frequencies you cut on the next one? <laughs> wait, wait, why did I cut what? The, the bass on this or how, what? How come you cut on the first EQ and then boost on the second one? I have interest. Oh, um, well, I boosted right here because I wanted the highs to be, there's no reason to it. <laughs> is that, I, I, I think like, like when you do two EQs in a row to cut more low end here, I guess I cut it a little bit more. Um, but then I increased the highs though, just cause this is not like, it wasn't cutting through the mix enough. And then I obviously have the decapitator here, which adds like a bunch of low end. And then I think Lee said, didn't you say like the low cut on the decapitator doesn't even work or? I didn't I know, say that. Or I think Joe might have said that. I, I um, said I always cut after the decapitate because 
yeah, like it adds artificial low end back in again. So yeah. if you look at it like, like on an analyzer or something. Yeah, any like saturator that. usually will add some sort of frequency range once you've saturated it. And I'll, just, I'll jump that with the EQing thing, but there's really, let's just say there's no wrong way to do it if it sounds right. So um, yeah. I also have stacked EQs sometimes. I do it all the time, I'm just not completely happy with it. Or I'll put an EQ before the compressor, and then after it's compressed, it sounds like you look at it on an analyzer, like he's saying, and it doesn't look like the same sound, so you have to sculpt it some more. And uh, all that's legal. I mean, that's there's no fucking rules anyway, so do what you want. <laughs> there, no yeah, one knows what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, and I think I'm like the prime example of that, where for like, I basically put decapitator on everything because it makes everything, you know, more warm and louder and it just punches in the club um for my bass i always for i use fat filter saturn i'll go into this more later on but this is just so i can uh saturate everything above the sub because um i generally don't have a separate layer for sub and mid bass um because you know if you're using this one shot or using operator it usually sounds pretty good unless i have like a like a specific mid bass patch but yeah, that's just kind of a quick run through and my track make me feel. I'll go more in depth on base mix, like how I do my mix downs, how I do my sound design and all of that later on. Yeah, and yeah. I'm, he's got a bunch more tricks on this project file, but we don't have time for everyone to get in depth, including some really cool stuff with how he did the vocal. So mm -hmm. thanks a lot, John. And just quickly, somebody, um, somebody asked, so you never cut the low lows. No, of course, sometimes you cut the low lows out of songs. I think John is just saying, you know, when you're talking about the higher percussion parts, the mids, that when people yeah. cut out those mid frequencies out of the percussion, that it tends yeah. to sound not real live, it sounds tenny, you know, or, but certainly, you know, a lot of times cutting the sub, you know, the low end completely out of a bass or something can remove a lot of mud. So it's not saying yeah. never cut lows, it's just saying, um, you know, he's just saying I with I'll, I'll always cut out like below 80 hertz though because like you know it doesn't need like the percussion stuff doesn't need sub because that will start interfering with it but yeah like some people just make things sound too thin when you don't really have to do that um cool well thanks a lot john i know you guys have a lot of questions again um right now we've got a lot to get through so we're only gonna be able to take the couple we took but John is available. We have a Repopulate Mars workshop uh, and you'll be able to do Q&A with every class and get answers on everything. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, Joe, did, did you want to go next? Yeah, that's cool. I'll jump on next. Thanks, buddy. So, in case you guys don't know, Joe Bradley is Latman. It doesn't say Latman on his... Uh, on his... Uh, on his uh, name there, but... He's Latman, one of our favorite Repopulate Mars artists. He's done a number of releases with us and Hot Creations. Uh, Joe, what do you want to talk to us about today? I'm going to show you one particular kind of technique that I do rather than going for a whole track and um, I want to rush through something quick. So I'm basically going to show you how I do a lot of resampling to make a lot of glitchy kind of sounds that I've been doing in recent tracks um, in a project that none of you have heard yet, which is coming out on Revival later this year. Shall I start? Yeah, please. So I'm just going to play a bit of the track first um, so you get a context. And I'm going to talk through how I made some of the glitch kind of elements to it. If, if um, get the audio working. One sec, I think I forgot to click share audio. camera off as well, sorry, because um, my computer is struggling a little bit.
what I'm basically going to talk with you through is how I made this sound here. Which is basically like a, a twisted percussion loop. But the way I've done it is like reasonably creative. So I've basically found a percussion loop as a starting point. So I'm just going to quickly find one now. Find a more normal one. Oh. This will do. So if we get a loop like this, I've basically made this by kind of modulating a load of effects on it and then recording it back into the project. So I'm just going to do an example. Um, using basically these devices that come with Max for Live. So I'm just going to basically tweak some parameters manually. And then what I can do with the LFO is modulate the parameters as the sound is playing. So I'm just going to find out some ones that will make it sound cool. And then I'm going to set the LFOs to modulate them, then record it back into the project. Start with that. So I'm just going to map this to pitch on here you can see it's now moving this and it also map it to the frequency and get it doing some interesting patterns so it's just the depth and then I've got this we'll shorten the sample a little bit and I'm gonna modulate a bit of flanger too <laughs> and this is how I make basically loads of kind of glitchy sounds I trap and record them back in. So I've got a pretty interesting sounding loop from that basically. Um it's gonna start the video again, which is how I make a lot of the sounds like this and then basically resample them back in. And I find it a really creative way to make your own sounds. And you can even make synth sort of sounds that you can reuse back in the project. But that's basically how I make a lot of sounds that sit underneath it, such as this one that I just showed you here. It's in the context of the track. I'm just going to turn the video off so you can play it again. Now you can listen to the whole track with it underneath and feel what it's bringing to the track. Joe, I think they're wondering how you resample it. Do you just like bounce? Do you just record it or? Yeah, I'll show that in one second. Sorry. Okay, cool. Yeah, no worries. It's basically, they're giving most of the character to the track in this situation because the drums and everything else here is so simple and the depth of the track has been brought by these kind of extra percussions that have been made by doing exactly this. Um, so I just want to give you a little flavour of that. And then I basically resample it back in by just creating an audio track and then choosing the input to be from the one I've just picked, which is one I've made, sorry, which is 42. And then just hit record. Oh! Just, ah. Recording it back in. Basically, I'm recording that back in. I'll take little bits out that I like, or maybe use the whole thing, or just like chop bits of audio out. But you can basically make your own really cool sounds this way. And that's what I'm doing a lot of my tracks. And that is pretty much what I'm going to show you today. And I'll go much more into depth in how I do this and other techniques to do this, as well as how I make my whole tracks and bass lines and everything else. But I just wanted to give you a little flavor of some one of some of the interesting, what I think is hopefully quite unique techniques that I use when making music. Yeah, that's super useful because I think everyone's looking for texture and for interesting sounds and you have a lot of control. You know, sometimes these little glitchy sounds you get in sample packs, they're in a key and it's kind of tough to pitch it into the key you're in because you're not usually working around these little samples. They're usually like icing on the cake. So if you're making them yourself, 
Oh, that's awesome because you have a, a whole lot more control to add it to your song, to make it tie into your song well, instead of just trial and error, flipping through sample packs and like piecemeal sticking it in there. So exactly. and that would work with any sort of sample, you know, like that's the cool thing. I was thinking like, oh, well, that would sound dope with a vocal. And you got that weird Ricardo effect from the old Ricardo records that I was like, I was like, sounds like an old Ricardo record, which is some of my favorite stuff. So it's and really from cool. Minimal is how kind of what this basically yeah, ideas for why I started doing this, but incorporating it into like what I'm doing now kind of gives a certain unique vibe. Yeah, totally, totally. It's fresh. Uh, let's see if there's just one question we can take really quick. Uh, Do you, do you always pitch drums to be in key? I guess I'll ask anyone here that. Uh, I, I by ear, so I'm, I'm always pitching drums and I'm using them. And I'm always more going through the process when I'm adding a drum element, like to make it the best it can be, as well as tweaking the envelope of like the MIDI and also then pitching it as part of the process to see if it sounds good, it can normally always be better. So I'll go through that process of trying tweaking it at least just to see if, just to like um, rule out that it's not really better pitched up or down. I'm not thinking that that drum needs to be C minor or whatever like that. Yeah, I think also a lot of sounds don't really have like a tonal element to them. A lot of them are just kind of like hi-hats that are, you know, very like noisy and don't have one clear pitch to it. So I think it's more just about how you want that drum to sound with the other sounds in your track. I agree. You don't have to necessarily pitch anything if it sounds good. Like I said, it sounds good. But if you're having trouble and it doesn't seem to fit in the mix, then maybe go back and be like, oh, maybe this tom is not in pitch, you know? But if it's vibing and it's just an EQ thing, sure. But if it doesn't seem to fit and it's poking out or it's arguing with the baseline or creating dissonance that you're not looking for, then you can go pitch, you know? But yeah, try again, try to do drums by feel. But if you have to pitch it, you should know. You know, like it'll stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, great. Tyler, do you want to go next? West End. This is West End. He's had one of the biggest tracks of the year. How about on Repopulate Mars? Was it? Oh, wait. Well, Lee, you're already there. <laughs> uh, well, why don't we? Am I, am I going or? Yeah, Tyler. Tyler, go Tyler, why, Tyler, why don't you go ahead? Me. Uh... But you guys, if you haven't heard it, check out his track with Sid, Jump In, one of the year's biggest, one of the year's best, on Repopulate Mars. And I'm sure we will get a class this summer with he and Sid will break down the making of Jump In, because I think that that's a, yeah. a really cool live class to have happen. Um, and it's just great to see guys like he and John, um, you know, Joe, and Deeper Purpose, you know, get, get into why not just how house tracks are made, but decision-making processes on remixes, on originals, you know, exact, the techniques are great, but also the why, the why you did something, where you started, this stuff is really valuable. I think if you're an up and coming producer to know, okay, started with this vocal, then step B was to write the baseline around that, or what, you know, the, the order of operations could be really important, I think, to figuring out how to make your own number one. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Um, I'm going to do just a quick audio check. Let me know if this is coming through. It should. All right, cool. So what I wanted to talk to you guys today about is a little bit of like a broader subject um, as opposed to like a specific technique, but it's just a little bit about like vocal sampling and how you can kind of use um, a vocal sample to drive the arrangement of a track. So to... Um, really kind of extend out your track and have the different sections be different from each other. So this is a track that isn't out yet uh, that I've been playing out and it's been getting good reactions. And I'll just play a little bit of like the build up and the drop for you guys so you can kind of hear the vocal. And then I'll talk about um, the original sample and then like some of the stuff I did to uh, kind of push the arrangement with that. So let me just play this for you guys.
All right, cool. So that's like a little bit of like this first build up into the drop. Um, and I actually, so this is an acapella that I found in like a big acapella folder. Um, I think from this producer Sosa um, he had, and I just found this acapella and I was like, it kind of caught my ear and I was like, we, I could definitely like do something with this. Um, and so I'll, I'll play with what the original acapella was like. Um, it's pretty funny. Let's see if we can play this. A little bit quiet, this song, but. I think this guy Mason made it popular with, with he had like a mashup with this track. Um, but that, that's what the original sounds like. So I was like, okay, this could definitely use a little bit of like a 2021 makeover. Um, and so this is actually a re-sing of the acapella. So I had a singer re-sing it. So it doesn't sound a l exactly like the original, but it's pretty much the same lyrics. And uh, this is like the full loop that I have. So it's just a four bar loop. I mean, I'll solo this for you guys so you can hear it. One, two, three, four. Let me scream if you want some more. Like, ah, uh, push it, push it. Watch me work it. I'm perfect. One. Okay, cool. So that's like all that I kind of have to work with vocal wise for this track. Um, and if I don't really do anything to this vocal and I just kind of use it throughout the whole track and like loop that, it's going to be really boring because essentially you as the listener on the dance floor, you're just going to keep hearing that same um, four bar loop over and over again and it's just going to kind of get old. So, um, you know, it's, it's very simple, but just finding ways to kind of change the vocal loop at different parts of the track can really help to um, make your arrangement a lot stronger. And also, if you're a DJ and I want you to play my track, you know, if all of your sections sound exactly the same, and it kind of depends on what genre you're playing, but if they all sound very similar, you know, maybe I want to, as a DJ, mix out of that track a little bit earlier because, you know, there's nothing new coming in. So if I can kind of extend this arrangement out and like save different parts for different sections, it gets a lot stronger. So what I did here, and I, I have a little color coordination, um, is I kind of just, in this buildup, I looped just this one, two, three, four. So if I play this for you guys. So yeah, it's just one, two, three, four, looping over and over again. And I have like a filter that's, it's like the simplest technique ever, but I do it in every track. Um, just kind of taking out those high frequencies so you don't really get that full sound off the bat. You, it's kind of dulled out a little bit. So that kind of repeats itself and that goes in the build up and you can hear that the filter is like opening up. So at this point, now the vocal kind of goes into like that full hook chorus. So the idea here is to like tease the vocal a little bit in the buildup and then kind of give it to them fully in the chorus. Um, and can I just say something there? That's yeah. really important. If you give that away too early, your track gets so boring. Like, like if you see what Tyler's been able to do with a small amount of vocal or what John did with a very small amount of vocal at yes. Deep End or Make Me Feel, they've got five five minute tracks that are never boring. And then, you know, it's also about finding one way that you save one part of a phrase that delivers at, at the end of the, the, the drop or something at the end of the breakdown. But, it, you know, it's teasing it in, slowly bringing it in, just giving bits of it. Because if you give away all that information at the beginning, you've, you've shot your load right at the beginning. You've got nothing and you've got a boring track. So yeah. I think this is an incredibly important technique to use with vocals and it means you don't need I write a lot of songs that are verse, chorus, verse, chorus, but I'm also probably not the best at teasing in vocals. So, uh, but I think this goes to show you can have two, you can have two lines of vocal and you can write a whole song around it as long as you know how to, to work it in slowly. So I'll let you get back to it, Tyler. Yeah, definitely. And I think you as a producer over time, like you will develop your own techniques and ways of kind of extending out little vocals. Like there's tons of stuff you can do with arpeggiators and uh, resampling like what Joe just did. So like, I know people that make tracks out of like one word or just not even a word, like a little, you know, vocal stab. But um, so yeah, this is like the first drop where I kind of have the vocal repeat a few times. 
And then, you know, the second buildup, it's kind of similar to the first one, at least in the first half, you can see it's like the same as here. Um, but then I kind of, I knew that I wanted to switch it up a little bit. So, I mean, it's really simple, but I just kind of repeat this one, two, so I'll play it here. Okay, cool. So again, without adding anything like new, I just took this one, two, I just kind of looped it um, like someone, you know, doing a countdown almost. And then I got even a little bit faster here where it was one, and then even faster. Here. And I'll show you guys a little cool trick that I did to make it um, to add some effect there. So if you look in this effect chain, I have this delay that is automated to turn on. So if I turn this off, it's a little bit more boring. So what this delay is, is like there's this cool mode in Ableton called repitch mode. So as you change the timing of your delay, it's going to pitch up the sound um, higher or lower, depending on whether you're speeding up that delay or slowing it down. So what I'm doing is I'm, I have a very short delay time. So it's like, I think it starts off at, um, I mean, it's pretty short, like 218 milliseconds, and it goes, automates down all the way to, I think one millisecond. Let's see the left delay time. Yeah, it's just like a pretty linear slope, but that gives it this kind of robotic pitching effect. You know, so it's kind of like a riser effect, but it's still like the vocal. Um, and so like little that that's what I kind of mean before by you have your own techniques of, you know, extending out a vocal or, or, or making it um, creating some movement there. So that also happens. another that's yeah. another example of creating a riser out of something that's in key from your own from your own track rather than finding, you know, a sample pack white noise and trying to make find the one that sounds good. You've created your own tension out of this out of the vocal itself which is less mud in the mix and um is already in key and sounds more you know it sounds makes it more cohesive yeah exactly um and like i that's something that now that i produce more and more like these days like i'm trying to make my track simpler and like if i can kind of make effects out of elements i already have it definitely sounds a lot tighter and cohesive um and then the last thing i was going to show you is um, okay, so like the vocal comes in in the drop again. And then, um, you know, for this third breakdown build up, I have three in this track. You know, it's, it's very similar to the first, but I do a little bit different with the vocal chopping. So I'll play this. So you can see, I, I mean, it's really simple. I just took each, you know, the beginning of each count of the words and uh, doubled it. So it's one, one, two, two. Just so it's a little bit different um, than before. I mean, if you're writing like tech house music like this, again, like the audience expects some repetitiveness. It's not going to be like a, a pop song where there's a lot of, you know, lyrical movement. Maybe there is sometimes, but, um, you know, it's just like little techniques like this to kind of extend out your arrangement. So, yeah, that's it. Awesome, man. Thank you, Tyler. And send me this after class. You bounce this yep. out. I got four shows this weekend. Yes, Either you are in New York, Miami, Orlando, or LA. Come hang out. Come check us yep. out. Especially LA. Come see me and John close out day trip. So thank you, Tyler. That was awesome. Send me that track. Uh, all right. So why don't uh, Deeper Purpose, where are you at? You're on? Oh, wait. I still need there you go. Yeah, I'm here. All right. Let's get this share in two secs. Hey, guys. Another, another Repopulate Mars favorite, uh, Deeper Purpose. You may recognize him from another neat recent number one, uh, his remix of Perupa. So, that's what we got. A lot of guys this. here. A lot of guys here really doing the business these days. Oh, nice. And what are the ads? Here it is right <laughs> in front of us. You get to see yet another number one track 
on Beatport, right, the project right in front of your eyes. You know, you'll get to see a lot of these if you uh, take the class. Here's the uh, discount code. Free yeah, class. You, you, only you can see you my number two, too. <laughs> <laughs> my fall short. <laughs> no right. shame. No shame in second place, buddy. <laughs> Fuck my life. I think, I think John's coming for me at the minute. He's at number three. He's creeping up behind me. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, right then, guys. So I want to run you through a few little bits on this. Um, I mean, I, I with my tracks, I work quite backwards. I mean, there's no right or wrong way to make a track, but I tend to start with all of my breakdowns first. So, I mean, like my tracks, they're sort of like the focus around them. It's like this big moment in, in a breakdown, this memorable moment, so to speak. And when I got offered to this remix, Obviously, there was a few key standout points from obviously from this like, original track by Rosala. Obviously, got a cool piano, the, the amazing strong vocal and stuff. So I've really started like this track with this breakdown. Um, I've just I'll play through like a few this little bit here for you guys, and you guys, some of you may have might not have even heard it yet. So, all right, let's, sorry, let's change my audio. Two sex. Oh, there we go. Output zoom. Oh no. Sorry guys. You you got uh when you yeah. share your screen there's a little checkbox in the bottom left. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm going to run you through is a few little tricks. So where I tend to start with my breakdowns, the, the you actually get like quite a different sound. Like so my, my main track and my bass and my breakdowns and the sounds there, they're like very like different to each other. So for, for me, that like transitions are like quite important and getting everything to flow together quite properly. Um, so for instance, in this track, so to get the piano to, to come in properly, I created a reverse reverb suite and I use these quite a lot so when I start to bring in vocals and I start to bring in synths or say for this instance the piano um, I'll just play you guys these two together quickly so you can hear what's going on here so you can see that it's so basically I've created a suite which matches the tonality of the, of the melody of the piano which comes in um, so I'm just going to run you guys through how I do this quickly. Um, so I use this on a, on a variety of different things. So first off, I'm just going to duplicate this piano track. Um, going to delete everything out apart from the first initial hit. Um, all right, let's drag this back. So then we're left with just the first hit of the piano. Um, what I then do is I go in and I grab myself a reverb, drop that direct on the channel, turn down the pre-delay, put a slight low cut on it and take the high cut off it. Um, I then drag the decay time up to about 15 seconds. Um, you can go a slightly shorter, but this tends to work better. Um, I'm just gonna rename this quickly, Piano Verbs, and I can find it when I route it back in. All right, so then what I then do is open up a new audio track and I route the audio from this, uh, the verb into this audio track, arm it, come back and then just hit record. Let that play out for a little bit. Uh, then if you just highlight it, uh, come on Jay, consolidate it, and then bring it back, bring the game back to zero and then just hit reverse. And then it's a case of just matching it up so that it flows nicely into this piano. Uh, about through the initial hits and then line it up. And then we have, if we put them both together. We create like a nice suite that flows in and say it matches the tonality um, rather than hunting around and find different sweeps, which you can do that. but. For, my, for myself, I just tend to do it this way because everything just tends to flow better and everything just matches up really nicely. Um, 
So that was one thing I wanted to show you guys. Um, there's another uh, bit of this track that I get asked about quite a lot, and it is sort of I've got like a, a stutter on on the vocal, um, which you can hear here. So you can hear it's like that part of the vocal, it starts to flicker and it's quite simple. And I've also did it on say on the fill here on this part of the track. And it's a cool little effect just to break up a vocal, especially if you've got a, a, like a long note that's being sung. Um, so I'll delve into you guys how I do this. So the way that I do this is that I use a compressor and I automate the output gain so I'll just turn this compressor off here so you can hear what it sounds like without it. Um, so this sort of really adds life to it and just like just obviously when you're sampling like obviously remixing tracks like you obviously want to try and put your own sort of spin on it. Um, so this was how I've done it. I literally say I've grabbed a compressor and then I've gone in and drawn um, obviously output gain so it's flickering on and off and then as it progresses I've obviously opened it up and allowed the allowed the output gain to stay on for longer. But behind that, it's also got a, a linear sweep sort of on the on the dry wet signal. So as it plays out, it's going from obviously the dry signal to 100 percent wet signal. So you're only so you're getting the flicker effect of obviously the volume on the output of the compressor coming in and out, in and out really quickly. Um, obviously, you can just it, it looks like it's taken me forever to draw it in, but once you get a couple drawn in, just obviously command C them. Copy and paste that across, then so we drag it out to your desired um, sample. Um, yeah, so that was that was two little things, two little tips and tricks I wanted to run through of this track. Um, awesome. Obviously, I get I get into on the course a lot more deeper about how I tackled this remix and and then creating the other elements. So obviously, there's no right or wrong way to start a track, but say like I start with my breakdowns mostly, and then I then have to progress on to then building a drop, etc. That then the actual beat that works with the original track. Uh, the, which the breakdown that I've made. Um, I can't go into more on that, obviously, on the full course. And this this remix is actually another very good example of teasing in both the vocal and the piano and then building it up, having a big crescendo and finding a way in and out of that to kind of have two separate sections of the breakdown yeah. that brings you back to your main bass riff at the end and your main drop and then having less of the, the vocal and piano. And also Good. another great example of creating a riser out of, you know, the piano there out of a song. And so that again, it's cohesive, fits in the mix. And then you've teased in your major elements, the most melodic ones, so that it wasn't just bored, you know, it wasn't just all there from the beginning. Yeah, definitely. So I mean, like with the piano, for instance, so if you go back here, it's like just after the first drop. So I just literally teasing a few notes because you, you've got you've got that big payload. You really don't want to give it all away, and you want like so. Obviously, you've got little elements that people are going to hear of this. Obviously, as you're mixing it in, especially like say on the club, for instance, and they're like, "Is it? Is it?" They're not they're not going to be 100 percent sure until they get the full, like say the full sample that comes in. That like it, it sort of builds tension and anticipation for what's to come when you tease the elements in. And yeah, you, you don't want people to get bored of your tracks. So you see, yeah, it's very much like, I talk a lot about this on the course, especially like my breakdowns and stuff about other ways to build tracks with other than just a generic snare row underneath and different ways of obviously being creative in your breakdowns. It's not just the sample, it's the motion in the ocean, apparently. <laughs> uh, and so Lee, uh, and thank you again, Stephen. That was awesome. Uh, Lee, you're going to get us into EQing because I do think, uh, you know, once you've got all these... Um, all these elements in your song and you've got you've got the idea down i feel like eqing is the next step and he's one of our resident uh mixologists mixologists yeah um i take i handle a lot of the the mixing side of things it's kind of my area of expertise i started mixing music for other people a few years ago and uh i really love it uh, I'm passionate about it because obviously if you have a great song and it's mixed terribly, you will not get it out on a record label. DJs will not play it. And uh, it'll basically be for you to sit in your car, your studio 
uh, forever and wonder why it didn't go anywhere. So, or for you to play at after parties to your 20 friends for the next 10 years. <laughs> and, and I feel strongly that's uh, not what anybody wants out of this course. So, um, uh, and I just quickly, you know, would like to add on my, from my personal experience that um, I had a lot of these kind of great tracks um, that at the time back in the, you know, late 2000s, that some big DJs were playing, um, but I couldn't get them signed. I had really crappy monitors. I had no treatment in my room. Um, I didn't really know any better and I didn't have money to just go out and buy everything I needed to, uh, to mix properly. So I actually bought a pair of better monitors from Mr. Lee Foss himself when he upgraded his monitors and um, then I started uh, learning a hell of a lot more and uh, doing some studying and uh, research on mixing. And then I treated my room a bit and um, then I got even more monitors and now I have A and B monitors, et cetera. And you can keep spending money until you're dead if you want to um, <clears throat> with things to get better mixes. But in this course, we are able to teach you how to to get better results quite quickly with either third party plugins, but I also try to give people um, the DIY Ableton style too, because you can see that a lot of these guys uh, have huge records out right now, bigger than any records of mine uh, with using a ton of stock plugins. So you're gonna see, they're gonna keep dropping in these third party plugins. Uh, and we always will give you our recommendations as we're going along. Um, but I will try my best, uh, let me get this out of the way here, uh, to, to show you the Ableton way of doing it as well. Because a lot of the, the early records that did really well for me, um, I had a very lean supply of plugins. So a lot of that stuff came from Ableton stock stuff. And over the years, Ableton has upped their game so much uh, with what they offer in, in the program itself that you, know, you can absolutely make a great record without third-party plugins. So uh, as we go through the course, you know, I'll have some more in-depth like, hey, can you get me the same sort of vibe with an Ableton plugin? And I'm happy to always like kind of walk everybody through uh, how to do it. So I'm, I've got just the groove I'm working on here. And I figured we would start with just the drums um, because the drums are the most important thing in dance music. So uh, I have a fairly simple beat. And the first thing I wanted to go through is just with EQing is now this is um, this is the kick that I'm using is a sample that I just recently got a, an SSL alpha channel. Um, and I've been playing around a lot, seeing what it does and what it's capable of, but they offer it in plugin form. And we'll go through that in the course, but basically here's a kick I ran through the alpha channel and I gave it a little bit more boost in the low end and this thing has a great saturator on it. Um, I kind of EQ'd it a bit. Um, and this is a couple of, I actually recorded uh, my layers of kicks into out through the alpha channel to reamp it back in and now I'm giving it a final EQ. So um, basically when I pull this up, if we turn off, the plugins here, I'll show you what it sounds like. So put my solos here. Um, so the, the actual kick sound to me was not sounding too bad once it was run through and reamped. Um, but I wanted to give a little bit more punch. And I noticed that it was it was lacking in the 300 to 260, 300 area, it flattened it out a little bit. So I did very little EQing, but what I wanted to talk about is see the, the cutting off the low end 
um, you know, we we already heard like when to cut low end, when not to cut low end. Well, okay, so your kick is going to take up usually, usually there's some house tracks that have higher kicks that um, have less low end and then more low in the bass line. So basically what you want to start with is what kind of frequency range it should occupy with the bass. Um, so this particular kick, I do have it rolled off slightly, but um, I, when, I, when I got into rolling off and really started uh, to, to shelve things a little bit, I was playing some of my tracks out in the club and realized that that really big push, and when I bring it over to Fosses, I'm like, where's that push? You know, because he has the barefoot monitors that are much larger cones. And I wasn't getting that push because I was getting too involved in trying to clean up the mix. And you, what you end up with is kind of a radio sounding mix, which is not what we're going for. We want our stuff to translate to the club uh, almost more than anything. Obviously, the radio is nice, but the mastering guys should be able to get it from there. So um, I've rolled off just a little bit of low end but you can see that there's still some sub frequency and I'm not going to cut that out unless it starts to interfere with something else. I've got a clap sound that I've also a little disco backbeat that I've cut up. A clap that I've reamped. Six oh six hi hat, simple hi hat. But really, the most important thing as we get the whole beat playing here, shaker loop, is how does how does the bass and the kick relate? So when I go over to the bass line, I've got my kick sounding okay. Uh, I wanted to go in here and now I've got these filters and you see I'm, I'm cutting below 60 hertz, but um, a lot of times I'll put these filters on for automation purposes. So like, so if I want to start the track, like we're talking about different ways to start a track, you know, if you, if you have top end on your bass that is actually working with the rest of the track, but you want to simplify the song a little bit. Can always open it up that way. So I'll play the the it's in it, it's in it it in it it Jesus I can't talk today. Uh, it in its entirety. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you can see in the bass here since I've got that filter dropping the low end, our kick is actually occupying yeah. a lot of this lower frequency here where my mouse is. Yeah. And I'm just leaving a little bit of that low end. Yeah. Like John was saying, I'm not, I'm not cutting out completely the low end of things just for the sake of doing it. Um, I, try to, I try to make the, the uh, cutoff point a little more rounded to leave some of the low end of the kick and the bass, even if I am cutting it. Um, and then if it doesn't sound right from there, you can start cutting it more. Uh, but I would say, don't be too aggressive with your EQing when you start out. But you can see here, um, there was some little bit of resonant spots in the, and this is called sweeping, where you can, take a very small parameter and I'm using uh, I'm using this fab filter EQ here because I love them I think everybody's kind of on these now is definitely the best EQ out there um, but you can do the exact same thing with Ableton by making the parameter the bell smaller and you can hear where it sounds out of key where it sounds resonant we do you not solo it when you're doing the sweeping What's that? Do you not like solo it by clicking that little headphone thing? Because that's what I normally do when I'm like trying to find those like uh, Yeah, sounds. yeah, you can you can also, that's what this thing is the bomb. Yeah, you can solo it. Because then you get to like really tell yeah. like when it like hurts your ears. That's like literally my cue and just whether it hurts my ears or not. 
Yeah, it's basically what John is saying is, but it starts sounding like it shouldn't be. This this one is like a multi-tonal, multi-temper bass, which is part of its charm. But I, there was these couple of these little frequencies that were were kind of hitting a little bit too hard. And the one thing I wanted to say to the class that's a free tip with equalization is that when you subtract from one area, it will push the sound up in the opposite relative frequency range, which I can't explain to you exactly scientifically how it works, but basically when you start carving out of one frequency range, it's parallel frequency range will spike a little bit over here. So uh, a lot of times you have, when you, you start EQing something and, and it's still not fitting, it's still not fitting and now it sounds different, um, that is because you're going to get some push in a different frequency range that's relative to it. So I've done a little bit of cut here and I liked a little bit of the high end coming through because it fit with the rest of the track. But um, so I always like to side chain compress and I don't know why before I go into my EQing. Um, that's again dealer's choice, but I always feel like if I get the sound ducking a little bit, and uh, we go into side chaining, we go into all the busing that I'm doing here in the class. But I would say, uh, as, a, as a rule of thumb, I always put a side chain on just to get the sound ducking. Then I EQ and then I start with the compression. And this is just a very simple uh, LA 2A style compressor from Waves. They have it in UAD. The glue compressor in Ableton does a really similar job. In fact, I can show you that the glue compressor and this, this is kind of what the glue compressor is modeled after. So if we go with like a similar tack and release here and turn this off, turn the threshold down and the makeup up, getting a really similar sound. Ableton has done a really good job with this type of stuff. So, <clears throat> yeah. and I have cut out the low end yeah. of the shaker here simply because it had some artifacts in the low end. This is like kind of a lot of low end for a shaker to have because it's got a ride symbol in it. So um, more or less what I wanted to show in today's class is that you should be EQing almost every channel. Unless you have a sample, a sample that's absolutely perfect, <clears throat> it is worthwhile to go through and treat every channel. Most professional engineers, um, you know, we'll get like wet stems from everybody, which means we get stems from people that already have effects on them, that already have EQing and treatment, um, which means that the producer has already done the job. So if, if you make the job easier for the engineer, if you're having something mixed, but in most cases, we're our own engineers. So, uh, you know, you want, you want to think about how each channel sounds in relation to all the rest of the channels. The, the shaker here, I've got just a little bit of mid cut around the 1K and you can hear that that's the, the bell on the ride symbol that I didn't really want to have poking through the track. Six oh six actually sounded, see, and, and this is the other thing um, we went into usually in the, in the free classes don't compress samples that have, that you get on slice, that, uh, splice that already sound good, because chances are that stuff has already been compressed by a producer, and you don't need to over EQ things that have already been EQ'd that fit. So everything is is constantly always by feel. Um, that's what I always try to teach that if it sounds right, don't mess with it. If it doesn't sound right, go in and first see what frequency range that it's supposed to represent and work from there. Um, but use your ears and uh, your feel more than anything, by far. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Okay, so does anybody have questions on EQ? I saw a specific one about attenuation. Was, was it three decibel? If you hear that piercing sound, was that three decibel attenuation? Was that the 
fuck. There's been so many jokes since then. I can't actually. <laughs> Yeah, that was kind of my fault. <laughs> that's no, a, that's a, it's part I, of the course. I yeah. made a joke about Lee admitting that I had a larger cone than him, and <laughs> subsequently, <laughs> nothing is there is nothing findable in this chat. Uh, well, okay, when you hear that piercing sound, is there a specific <clears throat> amount of attenuation? I know you're going to say, trust your ears, but um, is there an amount of attenuation you're looking for if people are looking for a number? Uh, that's that's actually uh, a good question. Um, pull it down until that frequency range, until that attenuation has completely stopped what you don't want to hear. And that the crazy thing is with that. <clears throat> sorry, I'm just getting over allergies. Um, is that it changes on every single sound. Sometimes you may have to attenuate quite deeply into the EQ to get that resonance to go away. Sometimes a synth or a drum may have that uh, a tone in it that is that is really sticking out that you have to almost bury it. And then other times you only have to move it like a dB and it'll just melt into the mix. So it's, yeah, it's kind of, uh, everything is always case by case. Um, Luke is asking, will cutting a frequency boost the octaves of that frequency or will it be more random? Uh, no, it just it does not boost the octave. It will uh, boost slightly the parallel frequency range, which uh, with, a, with a graphic EQ like this, you should be able to see as you cut it, you'll see that like, let's say we're cutting out some mid bass, you're going to see it start showing up in the the high mids a little bit so just be aware of that when you're eqing all right well i think that that's been very very helpful i want to thank all the instructors for jumping on today um i know not everyone who came to the free class will be able to afford to take uh, the class itself but we still appreciate you for joining us and jumping in and for anyone who's on the fence, like I said, uh, and everyone here, so they're going to get way deeper into lots of subjects. I've not had one unsatisfied uh, customer with these repopulate workshops. Everyone has had mega glowing reviews and, you know, many of them have taken lots of courses and said that this was, you know, a game changer for them. So hope to see you guys in the class itself uh, one last time. And It'll all, this will be up on YouTube for anyone to go and watch again on the Repopulate Mars YouTube. So again, thanks for me. I'm sure thanks from Dust Deep End. So there's a link. And again, thanks guys. Feel free to refer back to this and I hope to see you soon. Peace. Yeah. Peace guys. Repopulate Mars. See some of you guys this weekend in America for parties. Let's fucking get it. Sorry, D for purpose. <laughs> I feel for left purpose. out. I think it's <laughs> for purpose. See you soon. <laughs> Deeper purpose isn't a mine. He's tunneling to America now. <laughs> I'll be there in spirit. <laughs> we'll, John, we'll play your tracks. <laughs> John will be there. John will be there with spirits. It's yep. amazing how many people <laughs> want to know if you're drunk right now, buddy. I, uh, I know. Like at <laughs> eleven o'clock right now. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Right. Well, thanks, guys. Tyler, send me your.